think it helped clarify a lot of the issues that uh, that I intended it to do, uh, which is one, the main one is identifying periods and, and how we account for them. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, next. But uh, two other things that you're starting to see in these tutorials that you may not see in other courses. Uh, one is this dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, so up to now, most of your course questions in assignments and final exams and midterms are so explicit to the point that they're unrealistic. Right? When you start working, that sort of level of detail provided to you never happens. So the tutorials that I, I said in my courses generally are intentionally ambiguous, ambiguous and vague and uncertain. And people get frustrated with that really um, quite, quite substantially to the point of like, strong emails and asking for clarification and, and why don't you uh, give this information. Um, it's intentional, right? So it's um, just recognize that and work with it. So it's hard to recognize and realize that there's not the right and wrong answer to it. Okay? So it's more the approach that's important and the values themselves are kind of sort of off to the side. And so let's, uh, let's recognize that and work with that. The other one is uh, this idea of presenting your solution to the class. So all of you got to stand up in front of the, the rest of your group, uh, or sorry, the rest of your tutorial yesterday. A little bit intimidating for some of you, I could see that. Um, very, very hard, as you noticed, you got to see how the other groups presented their um, solution. It's very hard to present it clearly and to come across unequivocally and explain exactly what you're trying to get across. So those are, those are important skills you need to develop. You need to be able to think on your feet when you're answering questions from the rest of the class. You need to be able to think how to explain something clearly to, to others. That, that skill is helpful to learn the material because if you understand the material, that means that you can explain it to someone else. Okay? So being comfortable to present your solution to others is something that, that is really critical. There's, there's so many occasions when in my professional working career before I get back, where I had to speak to CEOs, four or five levels above me in the, in the organization, to explain the technical concept in a clear, unambiguous way in maybe two minutes. So it's a lunchtime conversation, or it's we're walking across the corridor, it's a quick question. Being able to think on your feet, unprepared, um, and answering something is, is an important skill to be able to, uh, to, to come across. Okay, so bear that in mind. Also, one other thing to say on that is when you're up at the front and you're presenting an answer to the rest of the class and someone else has a different viewpoint or I will correct you, don't take that as a threatening um, gesture, right? So I, I'm, there's going to be more than one occasion that I'm going to be in the front doing a work example and you guys are going to find a mistake, okay? And that's, that's I want that, uh, that discussion to happen. In the same way, when you're up at the front and you're not presenting something as clear, don't take it as it's not like attacking, it's more let's all come to some understanding of what the issue is here. In fact, I actually prefer it when the group up front is presenting something that's wrong because that way others can see it and we can, uh, we can talk about it and see different approaches to the, to the problem and sometimes incorrect approaches. <coughs> sometimes it's not necessarily incorrect but it's just an alternative. Okay, so when, when you're at the front and, it, and, and it don't, my, main, my main point is don't take it personally. Um, it's your group's solution that you're presenting, so it's not your solution that you're presenting, that's how I see it, and that's how I want the rest of the class to see it as well. Okay. Uh, just some other announcements. I've noticed the uh, quests are not being completed, so about 20 to 30% of the class have finish that. Um, it is due tonight by 9 p.m. and it is part of your grade. So it's part of that 12% grade. If you haven't done it yet, uh, sign in and, and finish that up. There will be one every week. So make sure this is just going to become a, a, just a regular part of your routine, uh, either on Friday or Saturday or Monday time frame. So it's always going to be near the end of the week or the beginning of the week. Just expect one of those emails to come through and, uh, and, and it up. So just to 
just because this is the first time around, I'm going to emphasize that in general, I don't even announce it. The email will just go automatically to your Mac address, um, and I'm expecting you to, to finish that up. Any issues with that so far? Anyone experienced any problems with the system? Okay, so just uh, let me know. Okay, so let's uh, just quickly have a recap then of this concept of periods. I did, I did this in the tutorial yesterday. I just want to emphasize it one final time because of the importance of it. So period, when we use this word, it's simply just another word to describe a duration of time. So e, e one month or one year. So, so that's, that's all that periods are. It's a straightforward uh, concept. But um, what is important is that cash flows occur within the period. So cash flows either in and out. So all those, those monies flow in and out. Interest payments come in. Sales from your selling to your customers <coughs> come in. Things leaving are expenses, salaries, taxes. We're going to see that coming up soon. Taxes are another cash flow leaving. And the, the money that you pay to buy your raw materials, overheads, utilities, those are cash flows in and out. They're all taking place. A lot of things to keep track of. So we don't, we don't deal with every single one of them. We just sum them up and report them at the end of the period. And we label our periods n equals 0, n equals 1, and so forth. And so that means that if we have, say, 8 periods, we will have n equals 0, n equals 1, ending with n equals 7. so that we can raise to the exponent n and that implies that the first period, in other words n0, has no time value of money change occurring. So the first period, the present value cash flow and the future value cash flow are the same numeric number because of that n equals 0 convention. And that's, that's a fair convention because that period is usually of a duration so that the time value of money isn't an issue. <coughs> when you're choosing periods which are too long, then you're going to have an unfair accounting for the time value of money. And that's what uh, one of the questions in the tutorial was raising. There. So periods that are excessively long, you really should be discounting time value of money, but because of this convention where we have no discounting in the first period, that may lead to some inaccurate projections. Any questions on that topic? Yes. Now, what do companies generally use <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the field? Like, what do you see? Okay, so when I worked at Glaxo, this was exactly what we used. N equals zero. What they for like duration of a year or a month? Oh, or durations. Durations were as it's context dependent. So a project significant capital expenditure where installation and purchasing of that equipment is going to take two, three years, and then you're going to produce in year four, five, six, seven, eight, then clearly a year is going to be the period of duration. But some quick turnaround projects, months. So if you're doing an NPV analysis to determine whether you should buy one sort of laboratory analyzer versus another laboratory analyzer, and the, insta the purchase of that analyzer is quick. You can just literally order it from the supplier and it can be delivered next week or next month. You can install it and get started to use it. The, and the benefits of using it show up within a month or two. 
then months make more sense. So that was never specified in our internal spreadsheets when I was working. The period was always just left flexible. Any other concerns, questions here? Yes, sure. Uh, yesterday in the tutorial, so question one where we had uh, uh, from 2013 to 2017, we four, four years, but uh, Jenna pointed out that we had zero, one, two, and three periods, but you showed us that we had to deflate the first year as well. Did I show that we had to deflate the first year? Oh, with the arrows going from years. So the first hop just is a first hop through the first period, yeah. period n0. And then you use exponent n equals 0, so there's no deflation during that first period. OK, so there was no deflation. Yeah, there's no deflation. Yeah. So it's just, I was just hopping through. Uh, so what Jervis is referring to, for those of you that were in the other tutorial, we had said, we had, we're asking what's the present value of a future payment in occurring in September 2013. So here's. September 2013, uh, sorry, 2017, right? Is that correct, 17? Okay, so we're here now in September uh, 13, and my period duration is one year. So here's this side of the line, on the right-hand side of the line is September 2014, here's September 2015, and here's September 2016. Okay, so how many periods? Four. There's four periods. N0 is this first period here. So sometimes the slides, the software that I've used in the slides to generate this, that don't do what I'm just about to describe. What you should do, and this will avoid any confusion, is write your N equals zero in the middle of the period. Don't write it here. That's exactly what leads to the confusion. Okay, so don't do that. When you're labeling your periods, write the label in the middle because that refers to the entire period. And that way you'll never write n equals 4 and get it wrong. Okay? So then we're deflating that money from September 2017 back to this time period. We just use this formula with n equals 3. And that means in the first time period, there's no time value of money. Great. So let's, uh, let's go back to where we were then last time. And uh, I'm just going back a few slides. So this is back to slide 48. And we had just introduced at this point what NPD meant. So it's simply defined as the sum of all cash flows accounting for their time value of money. So here's a cash flow, a net cash flow, income and expenses all taken together. We count for the time value of money and then sum them up. So net refers to the summation, present value, the sum of present values. And in the tutorial as well, I've asked this question that I've now added here. What does NPV of zero imply? And we had this discussion yesterday. Anyone want to just quickly recap what NPV of zero is? What would be the way you, your boss is up, so this happened to me all the time, right? I work for my boss, he, I fill in GSK spreadsheet templates, I put in my numbers of income and expenses. Someone in the finance department on the floor above has done all the calculations so that they work. The formulas are blocked off so no engineer can go tweak them and try to play around with it. And it gets NPV of $10. My boss who did his degree years ago was like, Kevin, what does NPV of 10 mean? I forget. Explain it to me. Five. Five seconds, what does that mean? That you make a profit. That you make a profit of? $10. And? In today's value. In today's value, so accounting for time value of money. So NPV of zero would say, what would you say to your boss? NPV of zero means? Okay, so all expenses that occur are going to come back in revenue, accounting for time value of money. So that's the, the key part. We're accounting for time value of money. We've neither made a loss, but we've not made a profit either. So zero dollar NPV is really that threshold where we start to consider our investments. I mean, ideally you'd like greater than zero, that's, that's clear, but zero dollars is a threshold number for us. Okay, 
So we, we went through this exercise yet uh, last time and we calculated the NPV for that cash flow. Here again is that question. Kevin, what does an NPV of $20,000 mean? So that, that can be explained in the same way. So that the profit we make of $20,000 in today's money over the five year period. So we're accounting for the deflationary effect of, of time. Okay, so now let's introduce a new, a new concept here. The discounted cash flow rate of return, DCFRR. And this concept can be introduced as follows. That interest rate I that we've been using here, 10%, 15%, we've used that number, and it comes from somewhere we're going to talk about it in a minute, like where we can how we can select that. But one can also ask, what if I adjust that value I? so that I get my NPV to be $0. Okay, so we've given our value I in the past. I've told you use 10%, 15% in your assignments. But now I'm asking you to flip it around. I'm asking you to tweak the value of I so that you move it up or down until the NPV equals $0. NPV over the entire time frame we're considering, N periods, capital N, let that equal zero, find that interest rate I. So what is, what is that? value I going to mean in that context? Okay. In order to invest into that uh, project, you want a rate of return equal to I. Okay, so to invest into that project, you want a rate of return equal to I. Or greater. Or greater. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to look at that interpretation in a minute. Here's a, here's a really simple example. I'll come back to the first bullet point. Take this one. And what's your gut feel answer? Don't even do any calculations. Just think of what's the first thing that comes to mind. You invest $100 now, you want $108 next year, what's the rate of return you need? 8%. Okay? So that's, that's intuitive. 8% 8, 8 is the interest rate I need in order to get $108 next year, investing $100 now. Now, prove it to yourself using that formula. Go for Hands up who's, who's pro proven it to themselves already. Okay. Yeah. Who needs a bit more time? So let's take a look at how one can show this to yourself. We're saying NPV is this formula. Let's expand that summation. 
in the first period, I have a cash flow C0. I'm just going to work in the denominator, so C0, 1 plus i raised to the power 0. That's my first period. I wish to have $108 next year, so next year I'm going to have a cash flow of C1, 1 plus i to the 1. So that's my net present value. I don't need to go on to a third period. period. In other words, n equals 2. So I stop there and equal that to 0. Yeah. So that's the definition. We're, we are, we're trying to solve for this equation so that NPV equals zero by adjusting the interest rate I. Okay, so our, our goal here is to find that interest rate I so that I get an NPV of zero. Yeah. Why do you have two periods? Why do I have two periods? So I'm investing $100 now, and I'm saying a year from now, I wish to have $108 paid out to you. Yeah? So the question is, why is there one period, or should there be two? So I'm investing $100 now. Okay, that money is going to grow at the end of the period to $108. They're going to pay me first day next period. Okay, so I have to have two periods. And we're, we consider all our cash flows as if they occur at the end of the period. So this is N0, this is N1. Okay, so what's C0? What's, what value do I use there? Sure. Negative 100. Negative 100, so I'm investing $100. I pay the bank 100 bucks, divided by 1 in the denominator. What's C1? C1's 108, so the bank pays me out $108 divided by 1 plus i equals 0. Okay. Just do a bit of rearranging to show 1 plus i is equal to 108 divided by 100. So i is 0 0.08. So we've, we use the NPV formula to find that interest rate so that my present value sums up to 0. <coughs> We're asking what is the rate of return I need in order to just get uh, get the NPV of zero to break even. If the interest rates were higher, if I was a value greater than than eight percent, that number is going to exceed zero. Okay? And if interest rates were lower, I would not. I really have two terms in that equation. Can you just explain the, 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 the numbers directly in that equation and get the answer for it? Okay, so back to two terms versus one term. If you use one term, so what would n be, the lowercase n? So, so the way I, 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 I wrote it, like the net present value is $100, and then the CN is, about, is the money you would want, that's $108. And I plug in 1 plus i to the power of negative n, and n being 1 here. So n being 1, small n being 1. Yeah, but you're always, your first period is 0, so where did your first period go But isn't that the money you would want like, at the end? So like, n being 100, and 100 would be equal to summation of 108 times 1 plus i. Okay, so, so we're asking NPV, you, you cannot use a value of 100 here. We, we're trying to find NPV so that it's 0. Okay, so we cannot set 100 equals zero. So we're saying, what, we're asking what is the interest rate so that if I invest $100, C0 is minus, minus $100. So I'm going to put, sink in $100. I want it to grow to 108 by the end. What interest rate do I need? So basically, the, the number of terms in the equation will, will always be one more than the number of years, or, or, the, or the number of periods, thankfully. I, you, I can't answer that and say yes and, and expect it to be true in every case. So the, the number of periods is always dependent on the, the, the question we're, we're facing. And so here we're looking, it's, there's two years involved. There's the zero year, N zero where I'm investing, and then a year from now I'm going to get the money back. In other, in other questions, um, the, the case is still good, right? So you can always just say there's one more in addition. 
is not generally true. So my point with this example here is we, we've got a very good gut feel. All of us said 8% here. But when we start to use this formula, then it's like, ah, oh, it's not quite so easy, right? So realize that all, that all we're doing in this system is we're, we're doing a little bit of the opposite here. Let's, say, let's go back um, to this previous example where we were looking at these payments. So I sunk $91,000 in, and then I started to earn money on that. I earned $20,000, 40000 40, 40, then 30000 so those future cash flows I received, they're not worth quite so much in today's terms. So that's, we're comfortable with that concept now. So we're comfortable deflating that 20,000 down to 17, the 40,000 down to 30,000. And we used an, a given interest rate of 15% to do that deflation. Then we summed up all those present values, accumulated the sum, and we got a value of 20,000. Now the question is, why 15%? What if I make that lower or higher? Okay, so what is going to happen if I decrease that interest rate from 15% down to 10%? In other words, I'm saying time value of money doesn't deteriorate quite so much. So if instead of 15%, we come down to 10%, the NPV at the end is going to be a higher number. Okay? If I take that interest rate up, 20%, so I'm deflating my money at a faster rate, NPV we expect to drop. Okay, so that, is everyone comfortable with that, with that uh, concept? So let's, uh, let's go to the spreadsheet on the course website then. So this is posted and you can uh, give this a go. So there's those cash flows over there. There's the 15%. Now what we're saying is, let's go make this say 10%. So all those numbers change, and now my, my present value there is, instead of the 20,000, has gone up to 36,000. So in an environment with higher interest rates, so 20%, now my present value is only 7,000. And if I take that up to, let's say, 22%, now it's worth less. If I deflate my money at 25%, now I get a negative in NPV. Okay, so I can keep doing this by trial and error until I find the interest rate that will allow my project just to break even. So that zero, remember we said, is a threshold value where we're breaking even in present day terms. So essentially what I'm asking is what is the interest rate that will cause me to break even? And we can do that by trial and error. You can use Goal Seek in Excel um, or here in the uh, then you can, in Google Docs, you can eventually find that a value of 23.6%, of 20, so 0.236 uh, is what sets that cumulative value equal to zero. So we say then our DCF RR, we use this acronym, is 26.3%, by 23.6%, the wording we use. Discounted cash flow rate of return. So that's a, a bit of a mouthful. Um, the other way that people will often phrase that is they'll use the word IRR, internal rate of return. Um, and just the just a, a mention there on IRR, that internal refers to the cash flows within the project. So we're not considering other projects' impacts on our project under consideration. We're only considering one project independent of the others and looking at the cash flows in and out of that boundary for that project. So that's what the internal refers to over there. So here we've uh, done this here, this uh, same example I just showed you now on the spreadsheet. So we have those flows of money out, flows of money in. And you can prove this to yourself at home that by tweaking that to 0.236 that you get a value of zero. Now, let me take a a step further here. Yeah, I'll just go two, three slides ahead and then we'll come back to that other, other example. Let's jump ahead to slide 60 and just have this discussion. Because for NPV, let's take a look at NPV as our measure of profitability. The, the dollar figure of zero dollars is our threshold between an investment that, performs, that has negative 
profit and an investment that has, has positive profit. And so NPV equals zero is a threshold that judges whether an investment is worthwhile or not. But if we're looking at DCFRR, or internal rate of return, and I calculate this value of 23.6%, the question now is, should I invest in that project or not? Okay, so what is, in other words, what we're asking in another way is what's a good DCFRR and what's a poor DCFRR? Okay, so where is my boundary between an investment that's worthwhile and an investment that's not worthwhile? And the way we answer that is, let's look at what a company can do with their money. So big corporation has money available. They choose to invest in various projects in their company, and they calculate the DCFRR for various projects. First question, do you pick a project with high DCFRR or low DCFRR? The bank wants to pay you an interest rate of 16% and an interest rate of 10%. Which bank do you go with? Okay. Same idea again. You go for the rate of return that's highest. Okay? If you're choosing between two projects, you want to pick the project that gives you the highest rate of return. So when a company can make a decision on where to put their money, they can either park their money and earn no, no value on it. So just hide it. They can deposit it in a bank account. They can uh, use it to loan out to other people and earn interest on it. Uh, they can go invest it in the stock market. They can go find venture, other venture firms to invest in, or they can go to some really high-risk projects. So, what you will, what you will do then is that companies will then have a minimum acceptable rate of return. So, the companies I've worked in, that number is pretty conservative. It's around ten percent. Any project with a rate of return lower than ten percent is not considered anymore. Okay. Because a project that's only returning, let's say, 5%, the company can have other ways of investing that money that will earn them at least 10%. Okay. So projects that earn lower than that threshold are out of consideration. Pro projects above that threshold can be considered, and then they'll start to look at other factors. Okay. So minimum acceptable rate of return is a different number for different companies depending on where they are. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a look at some examples next. Okay, now for those of you that have done the business courses, you understand how companies raise capital and how they choose to deploy capital. So companies will raise capital on the stock market, they'll issue bonds, they get all this money flowing into them, now they have to choose which projects to invest in. That's what we're considering here. Which projects should I, I pick? So these companies will have certain minimum requirements. And here's, um, here's some guidance on what those minimum rates of returns are. So a very safe, low risk investment is around four to 8%. And, and companies which are in high, high tech R&D and where they're developing new markets, they're expecting rates of returns close to 50%. So what I want you to do is just uh, talk with the person next to you and give me a name of a company that you would identify as being in this category, in this one, in this one, and so forth. The name of a company or a type of company. Think about it for a minute. What would be a company, for example, or what would the company be doing in the medium risk category? Okay. Give me an example of that. Is the MARR the same as the um, internal, like the IRRR? Is that the same interest rate? No, so we're going to we're going to compare our IRR to the MARR. And so what I first want you to just consider is what's the minimal acceptable rate of return. Thank you. 
Now that same company investing their projects in a different sector, let's say that oil company now is in this mode, new product or process technology, they have an established market position, they would actually have different MARR. So same company, different MARR for a different type of project. So what would be an example of the third row? Automotive industry, they do bring out a new car, company launching a new car. Launching a new car, that's a great one, yeah. For the oil companies, would be something like oil sands. Oil sands, so they're investigating new technology to process that stream. Right. Apple. Apple, in which sense? Uh, new so the new iPhone, for example, the, new, the newer version of the iPhone, or? Not version, but the new, completely new product. Completely new product. The iPad. Okay, so like when they introduced the iPad, or so I, uh, yeah, so the new iPhones. Okay, so. New process or product in a new market. I would use the iPhone example for this one. Yeah. It's a new market. No one was there when it first was established. When it first started. Okay, so Apple's contention is because people have different opinions on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Google, with their Google Glass that they got. Okay, yeah, Google, Google Glass is a great one. It's a totally new market, totally new system. Like electric, like electric cars. Electric cars, yep, totally new market. Would you say that they're introducing a new technology to a country that would have never had it before? So something that already exists in our backup, but introducing it to someone in Asia or somewhere in Africa or something that's had it before, would that be? That's this guy, yeah. Marketing development. So marketing development, who knows that term? Finance people. Yeah. Marketing development, do you want to describe it? No? <laughs> okay, so marketing development is you're, you're creating a new market for, for your company that doesn't exist. Okay, so you're developing it from scratch, new customers that you, you haven't targeted before. Um, so I would use that example of moving to a new country where they do not have that. So different MARRs for different types of projects. 
even the same company will have different threshold MARR values. So once, the, once you have your MARR, that's your minimal acceptable rate of return, you want rates of return that meet or exceed that. So you need your DCFRR to be greater than or equal to that MARR for that project to be considered. If your DCFRR doesn't exceed that, that project is likely going to be excluded. Okay, so the, the next thing I want you to start to appreciate is there's not one single criteria that's used to judge projects. We've seen payback time, return on investment, NPV, ECFRR. There's several other factors that companies can use. Okay, so it's not automatic that you just follow a sequence of rules. The other thing I want to talk about here just quickly is, as you notice we go down the list, what's happening to risk? The risk of that investment goes up, okay? So this value here builds that in. When I asked you last class what factors you would consider when you're evaluating investments, I asked you, like, you've got $50,000 and you want to lend it out to someone. Several of you had mentioned risk involved. What's the potential risk involved? This is one way to build that in into that judgment. So using a higher MARR, you, you pad that value with some additional percent to account for risk. And so a company can easily get 10% say from, 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 the, from the bank, 10% interest rates from a bank, but then if that project's got additional risk, they may pad that MAR with an additional 4 5% to account for risk. And so as you go down with more and higher risk projects, MARR goes up. That's, that's, a, that's a common feature. And so companies will account for risk in that particular manner. So let's go back then to this example. I'd like you to take a look at these cash flows. So this is back to slide 56. <coughs> and we're now looking at comparing investments. So what I will tell you right off the front is that you notice here that every project A, B, and C invests the same amount of money. So that's clear. And then in year one, two, and three, we receive these cash flows coming in. Okay, so let's take a look at that diagrammatically, because looking at it as a table of numbers is okay, but uh, this might be far more useful way of looking at it. So project A, we sink 1,000, B, 1,000, C, 1,000. Then we've got future cash flows in year one, two, and three. So year one in red, two in orange, year three in red. Different cash flow patterns for project A, B, and C. Now we go do the calculations for DCFRR. And you can show by trial and error that if you take those investments values of 1,000 and in those future um, cash flows coming in, you discount them by a percentage, let's say 10%. You calculate your present value, you sum them up, and you get a total over here. Then you go tweak that percentage. In this case, it's that, that entry in that cell. Go tweak that number up or down until you get a zero over there. In other words, what I've done is I've calculated my DCFRR to get that equal to zero. Okay. And I go do that for project A, project B, project C. What you'll find with these three cash flows is that all three projects have the same DCFRR of 20%. Okay. Now there is a shortcut function over here, IRR, that you can go use. I don't recommend it, but it is a, it's, a, it's a quick way to do it. Okay, so that's, that, that's by the way. What I'm more interested in here is project A, B, and C. All three of those projects have the same DCFRR of 20%. So taking into account time value of money at 20% makes all three projects break even in the final year. Which project do you pick? The one the lowest MAR. One of the so MARR, let's, this, this is one company, they're investing. So one, this is one company, same MARR, same DCFRR as well. Would you pick the one that gives you the highest amount of money later because then it's worth more? The highest amount of money later because it's worth more. Absolutely. Exactly. 
So, but but be careful here. The highest amount of money because it's worth more. All three projects are worth the same. They're all breaking even to zero dollars because I've taken the time value of money into account. They're all worth zero at the end of the three years. <laughs> okay. Okay, Joe. I'd say I'd, I'd like to receive more the sooner I can, so I don't take your cash flows just because it's less riskier. Um, okay, so Jervis wants more money sooner rather than later. Okay, any other opinions? Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I want the money sooner because maybe if you get more money sooner, you can use that like high amount of money to invest in more projects, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Congrats, you okay, so Okay, so this is a, this is exactly where I want you to start thinking and, and point out that using one me measure to judge profitability isn't what companies do. Okay, we never do this. Here we have three projects, they all are equally good when we're considering the DCFRR as our way to, to evaluate the project. All three of them have a DCFRR of 20%. In other words, the time value of money of 20% leads to all three projects breaking even at the end of that, of that time. So then subsequent factors come into account. Like, like Jova said, and a few other people mentioned, I would rather have money in my pocket in year one so that I can redeploy it to other projects later on. Other companies may not have that concern at all. Other companies may like, uh, let's just go look at those actual cash flows. So here, project A gives you a high cash flow coming in in year one and then it scales down. Some companies may prefer this instance, project C, which gives them a more even distribution of money over time. So they can, they've got a more regular money flowing so they can plan around salaries and other expenses on a more uh, on a more regular basis. Other companies can handle this sort of risk where the growth in that investment ramps up towards the end. So they reap their money later. Okay. Again, context dependent. Other alternative uh, sorry, other factors come into play. We don't always consider one metric. So let's just uh, let's quickly recap here what we've looked at over the past few days. Um, We've looked at four ways to judge investments. Um, I'm just going to go to this slide 65 here. Sorry, it's a, bit, a little bit all around today just because um, I'd rather let the discussion flow as the class's questions come. So we've looked at four, four ways. We've looked at payback time and we've looked at ROI. Neither of those options consider the time value of money. Payback time is literally just the time to recoup your investment. ROI is a percentage based on profits divided by the money invested. Then we looked at two others, NPV. NPV is judged as a dollar value. And what we wanted is we wanted NPV to have a dollar figure greater than or equal to zero. So NPV, our threshold was zero dollars. And then the last one we've considered now is DCFRR, and we want that to exceed a minimal acceptable rate of return. So those two metrics, NPV and DCFRR, both take time value of money into account. Both of them need you to estimate what the project's useful life is. That's another, another important factor. Payback time doesn't need you to know what the project's total life is. ROI doesn't need you to know what the project's total life is. But when you consider time value of money, it's clear you need to estimate the time that the project's going to be operating. Both of these, uh, NPV and DCFRR, are what you must use in your course project and in your future career. But there's others as well. There's, a, there's, there's multiple metrics. We don't talk about them, there's, there's, there's several others. The key point here is that companies will use both of these to evaluate projects. And we're going to look at that in tomorrow's class.